and ours. Okay, once again. Once again, good morning. Our speaker today is uh, Ted Jacobson. And uh, 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 Ted, can you uh, share your screen? Yes. Um, hold on, let me just get it to the right spot. And the title, Reduced Phase Space Quantization of a 2 plus 1 Dimensional Causal Diamond. Ted, please go on. OK, thank you. Let me just get rid of this uh, bar hide video panel. No, I'll get rid of that bar. Loading meeting controls. OK, great. So um, I used to be interested in non-perturbative quantization of general relativity until I got fed up with it being too hard a problem. Um, but I've actually come back to it with a student here. And the student I want to emphasize is really the leader on the project that I'll be um, talking about. His name is Rodrigo Andrade e Silva. It took me a long time to learn how to say his Brazilian last name, which is Andrade e Silva. Um, so it's his thesis project, and he's a very um, mathematically inclined, uh, very sophisticated mathematically uh, student who came to Maryland with a master's degree from Sao Paulo. Um, so he's really the leader on this project, and I'm kind of like his spokesperson, I would say. But I think it's very interesting work, and uh, I wanted to, you know, share it and advertise it. So that's why I chose to speak about it. I think it will be interesting broadly, as long as you're um, interested in quantum gravity and have some mathematical, you know, facility. There's some construction on the street outside my house, which just started. And I think it's a problem. So I, I'm going to move to a different room in the house. It will just take me one minute, OK? I didn't realize that would be happening. Okay, so can you still uh, see me, etc.? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, we have published together a, a short summary of this project, uh, very brief, which is already on archive, and a, an extremely long paper by Rodrigo with all details and a lot of more material will be coming out soon. So the challenges of quantum gra of canonical quantum gravity of, are many, some of which are listed here. Um, the ambiguity of what it means to quantize, actually, a uh, complicated system like general relativity, the absence yeah. of local observables, of course, the non-renormalizability in higher dimensions than three, many technical complications, the problem of time as a conceptual one, and the need to gauge fix a huge gauge freedom, and the question of whether after gauge fixing, the result depends on which gauge you fixed. So all these motivate exploring, you know, simplified settings, but not too simple. For example, homogeneous isotropic cosmology has been well, you know, quite explored in canonical quantum gravity, but it's so simplified that, you know, many of the problems don't even arise there. So the context uh, would be best if it's simpler, simple enough to make some progress, but complicated enough to exhibit more of the issues. And that's what leads to the setting that we looked at which is two plus one dimensional GR. So there are no local degrees of freedom. And um, also, though, in order to bring in the idea of a localized or quasi-localized system, 
instead of considering asymptotically flat or asymptotically anti desitter we wanted to consider a bounded domain. Now, how do you bound a domain in a diffeomorphism invariant way? Well, you give the domain a boundary and specify something at the boundary. So we are taking the um, topology of a spatial section of our spacetime to be a disk whose boundary is a, is a loop. And we, we fix the metric, the one-dimensional metric on the boundary loop which is uh, indicated here as gamma. So the variables, canonical variables on the disk at, in, in phase space before we reduce the phase space by constraints and, and by the gauge are a, the two-dimensional metric HAB and conjugate momentum pi AB. The disk here is called D. And then Classically, you know, initial data on such a disk would determine the space-time in the domain of dependence, which is something like this, you know, uh, distorted diamond-shaped space-time region here, and that's why this we refer to this also as the as quantizing a causal diamond. Um, right, but it's the phase space of initial data on the disk that's being quantized. And as usual, the conjugate momentum is the extrinsic curvature K of the disk in the space time minus its trace times the two metric times square root of the determinant. So that's the physical system that we want to, you know, figure out what it means to quantize it and ideally figure out something about observables and properties of that quantum space time. Part of the question even is what is quantum spacetime? Because, you know, we know that naively, you know, the metric and the conjugate momentum don't commute with each other. So they can't be simultaneously specified in quantum mechanics. And so that means that there doesn't exist a metric and an extrinsic curvature that's well-defined simultaneously. Um, so, what does that mean about the quantum nature of a causal diamond? That last question is a deep one. And actually, I don't, so far, what we've done hasn't done anything to answer it or, or even address it. But I do think that it may be possible to, um, to make progress on addressing that question. Now, this isn't a brand new uh, setting. Um, we're going to carry out the reduction using fully using uh, this is CMC constant mean curvature gauge and assuming a cosmological constant that is non-positive. So I, strictly speaking, it's nice if it's negative, but I think we can handle the zero case also. I'll, I'll show you why there's just a slight technical question about the existence of CMC gauge globally. A similar type of thing has been done for closed space time. So, you know, topology of a sphere or a torus or some other Riemann surface where um, once you've factored out, you've imposed the constraints and factored out diffeomorphisms, it leads to a finite dimensional reduced phase space. And that was initiated, I think, by uh, Vince Moncrief a long time ago and Arthur Fisher, who joined Vince in the project, and Steve Carlip explored it some, and also Ed Witten back in the days, like maybe the late 1980s, I think is when this was done. Um, but that's a finite dimensional phase space. It's also been considered for asymptotically anti desitter space where this phase space is oddly infinite dimensional. And it turns out to be infinite dimensional for the case we're treating as well. And that case is closely related to the asymptotically anti desitter In fact, the phase space will be identical, but somehow it's also physically quite different because um, in our case, we've fixed the boundary, the, the circumference of the boundary loop, we fixed the metric and therefore the circumference or the length. And um, there's nothing corresponding to that in the asymptotically anti desitter case because the boundary loop is infinitely big at the boundary of anti desitter space. You can think of the reduced phase space we're going to wind up with as what's called boundary gravitons. 
Uh, it's just a fancy name for the fact it's the degrees of freedom of the gravitational field that um, are kind of non-locally, uh, that are non-local and can be specified at the boundary. So then what are the physical states before we get started with the math? What's the physical interpretation of the classical states of this um, thing? There are no local degrees of freedom, like I said. And the diamond is locally anti de Sitter space if we have a negative cosmological constant, let's say, because um, you know, that's the only solutions to the Einstein equations in two plus one dimensions with a negative cosmological constant. So that means that whatever the diamond is, it embeds somehow into a global ADS3 space time. And um, because it's finite, as shown in the picture, its shape is observable. In other, in other words, its shape is, is meaningful in the reduced theory. So basically this is a theory of the shapes of a finite causal diamond embedded into ADS with a fixed boundary metric. By the way, please uh, pipe up and ask questions if there's anything you'd like me to clarify or anything you object to or whatever. Okay, so what am I gonna do in the talk from here on? I'm gonna introduce this constant mean curvature time solve the constraints. Uh, so, so if I can interrupt, yeah. I, I wouldn't really call this diamond this locally ADS because I understand that this is just some uh, solution to, to I, oh, I, I see, but, but okay, okay. You, you say that since, since this is, um, I, this is, this is solutions. So, so all solutions are locally the same. Yes. Exactly. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. So if you think of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll solve the constraints and remo remove all gauge freedom and identify precisely the reduced phase space. And then also identify the Hamiltonian, um, which is something actually that was done by Jim York a long time ago. Yeah, there's a lot of things in this work that go back to the early days of quantum gravity and um, in fact, here's another one. Chris Isham uh, was concerned about what does it mean to quantize a theory like general relativity whose phase space is not just presented as a vector space. And uh, he introduced a method called group quantization. And I will uh, introduce that, illustrate it with an example of a particle on the sphere, and then apply it to the causal diamond. And this is where things get pretty subtle, actually. Um, but it can be carried out precisely. And that leads to a particular like out infinite dimensional um, quantum algebra of operators, which I guess I, I, don't, I won't anticipate now, but it would be easy to say what it is. And then we wanna look at uh, irreducible unitary representations of that algebra, basically to define quote unquote, the quantization of the theory. And we won't get uh, that much explicit about those, but we will be able to show that this, the spin of the diamond, which is equivalent actually to the twist of the loop around the boundary of the diamond, is quantized. And so I'll define what, this, what the twist is and show, show why it's quantized. And then I'll end with open questions. So first, this uh, constant mean curvature time gauge. Um, you, we would foliate the domain of dependence of the disk with constant mean curvature slices. Um, again, the constant, the mean curvature is the trace of the extrinsic curvature. And uh, as the slices go up toward the future in the diamond, that actually decreases. So taking minus the negative of it, you get an increasing time coordinate labeled tau here. And this is a coordinate that was considered by York, and he worked out the Hamiltonian that generates this, which we'll get to later, provides a convenient gauge fixing. And it actually can be, no matter what initial data we take on this slice, on one slice, the entire domain of dependence can be foliated by such slices. So it's like a, good, a globally good gauge for the interior of this diamond. 
Yeah, this goes way back to 1972 when York introduced this time gauge. So then we have to solve the initial value constraints to get down to a reduced phase space. And that's what happens uh, on the next couple of slides. This is also a very old story. I think the method of solving them on a constant mean curvature slice was introduced by Lish Narowitz way back in the 1940s. Um, so you write the extrinsic curvature as a trace-free part, sigma AB, and then the trace part, a half K HAB. And in those, in terms of those quantities, the constraints are that the divergence of sigma is zero, the covariant divergence with respect to the H uh, covariant derivative, and the Hamiltonian constraint minus the Ricci scalar plus the square of this sigma minus something called chi is zero. And chi is composed of the square of the of the mean curvature k, so there's actually a one half t tau squared, and then if there's a cosmological constant minus two lambda. So if lambda is negative, notice that chi is positive always. If lambda is zero, chi is positive except on the maximal slice of the diamond. So probably we can handle chi is zero also because the key is that we need chi to be positive to guarantee that there exists a unique solution for the Hamiltonian constraint. Now, how do we solve it? We start with seed data, uh, metric and a, and a sigma, satisfying the momentum constraint for a sigma and the boundary condition for the metric that reduces to the one-dimensional fixed boundary metric. Then we apply a file transformation to the metric with some exponent, well, just with some vial factor and a corresponding vial transformation to sigma, but with the power uh, minus two phi. And if you do that, then the new sigma, the tra vial transform sigma will be still covariantly divergenceless with respect to the vial transformed metric. So the momentum constraint is satisfied. Um, because it's constant mean curvature, the, the, the trace part of the conjugate momentum is trivially uh, divergence-free. And the boundary condition implies that we better not change metric at the boundary because it was satisfied already by the seed data. So we should take phi to be zero at the boundary. And then if we plug that metric and that sigma tilde, into the Hamiltonian constraint, we get a second order partial differential equation for sigma. This is the Lishnerowitz method. And this equation is called the Lishnerowitz equation in the case of two plus one dimensions. These uh, vial factor dependent coefficients depend on, their, their exact form depends on the space time dimension. But in two plus one dimensions, it looks like this. So it's an elliptic equation for phi with the boundary condition that phi vanishes at the edge of the disk. And everything else is determined by the seed data, you know, the Ricci scalar, the square of sigma. It's some very nonlinear equation for phi, but it has a unique solution for every seed data. And therefore, um, we've succeeded in solving the constraints provided, like I said, that chi is positive. So what corresponds then to a, um, a solution, we have to identify any two seed data that are related by a vial transformation of the same form as the one we did to solve the equation, corresponds to the same, determines the same um, solution to the constraints just shifts the phi solution by whatever lambda you put in there. So an equivalence class of seed data like that corresponds to um, a unique solution to the constraints. Okay, that's good, but we still have a lot of gauge freedom that we have to get rid of. So we're now on the constraint surface, but we wanna go further and get rid of all the gauge freedom. Gauge freedom, what is it? It's the remaining gauge freedom. We already fixed the time gauge freedom because we picked the constant mean curvature 
surfaces. We need to remove the boundary, the spatial diffeomorphisms that map the disk into itself without changing the boundary. So that is uh, an element of the reduced phase space is an equivalence class of seed data that is not only vial transformed in the way that I showed, but also is then followed by an, the action of a diffeomorphism psi that maps the disk to itself, Act, um, that maps both those two tensors. And uh, you know this lambda should be zero at the boundary because we're preserving the boundary metric as before. And the diffeomorphism psi is also trivial at the boundary. So that's a kind of abstract a statement about what the phase space is. It can be identified actually, these are conformal geometries, the set of all possible um, conformal geometries with a given boundary metric. Uh, it would have been trivial if the topology, let's say of the space were not a disc, but were a sphere, because then there's only one conformal geometry. If it had been, uh, let's say a torus, there would be a, a moduli space of conformal geometries. And in this case, it's actually an infinite dimensional space. Um, and the symplectic form on this phase space, we inherit from the original Poisson brackets between the conjugate metric, with the metric and its conjugate momentum. And so what this really is, is a cotangent bundle of the space Q, which is just the conformal geometry. So the phase space is the cotangent bundle of the space of conformal geometries of the disk with fixed boundary metric. And the symplectic structure that we get from the original, you know, let's say Lagrangian of the theory is the canonical symplectic structure on a cotangent bundle. All cotangent bundles have a natural symplectic structure arising from their canonical one form, and that's the one that we have here. Let me just pause for a second and make sure, are, are there any questions about this? Okay, it's still a bit abstract because it's Q is the, uh, oh, is there a question? Everything, everything is clear. Yeah, thank you, go on. Okay, great. So Q again is the conformal geometries, but that's that's a word. It's not an it's not an equation. It's not a formula. How do you coordinateize these conformal geometries of the disk? We're going to do that. Well, a way to do that is to realize the disk as a homo the, the geometries as the space of as a homogeneous space. So notice that the diffeomorphisms of a circle. Actually, plus means orientation preserving. So the orientation preserving diffeomorphisms of a circle acts on the boundary of the disk. And in fact, it also can be extended to act on the whole space of conformal geometries. And in the following way, given a boundary diffeomorphism of the circle, choose, um, choose a, a, a function phi on the circle, on the boundary, such that the combination of the vial transformation and the diffeomorphism preserves the boundary metric, right? I mean, an arbitrary diffeomorphism of the circle into itself will not preserve our boundary metric. But if we're allowed to make also a vial transformation on the boundary, we can always correct for or reverse the change in the metric. So, so we choose some vial factor such that the metric is preserved. And now this transformation at the boundary can be extended arbitrarily into the interior of the disk, going from lowercase psi and lowercase phi to uppercase. Now we've got a orientation preserving diffeomorphism of the disk and a function on the entire disk. And we restrict those so that they, on the boundary, they have the values that we started with. And then that actually, oops, passes to the space of equivalence classes that we had before, because the, the action of, of psi on an, a conformal geometry, which is an equivalence class of metrics, you can just 
define it by taking the equivalence class defined by the action of this extended action into the bulk. And just because when we form the equivalence class, we're quotienting out by all the interior vial and diffeomorphisms, um, you know, that, that's a well-defined action on Q on the space of conformal geometries. So what's the upshot? It's just that diffeomorphisms of the boundary circle or define an action. They map one element of Q to another one. And they actually do so in a transitive way. So you can get from any conformal geometry of the disk to any other one by the action of one of these size. Because all disks are conformally equivalent, if you allow arbitrary conformal, you know, diffium combined diffios and vials that act non-trivially at the boundary. So basically we can get from any element of Q to any other one. And, and since it's a transitive action, that means that Q must be just the diffeomorphism group of the circle mod the little group H that leaves some element fixed. Because it acts transitively, but not, what's it called, freely. I mean, there'll be, if you take a given conformal geometry, there's going to be some little group of, of subgroup of the diffios that doesn't change it. And to figure out what that group is, just start with any element of Q. And the simplest one is just the equivalence class of the unit round disk. Um, and, and the group of, diff, of conformal isometries of the unit disk is PSL2R, that's projective special linear group in two real dimensions. It's a three-dimensional group um, and it leaves invariant this disk. And therefore we now have a kind of explicit or more explicit representation of what the space of conformal geometries is. It's this homogeneous space that's diff the orientation preserving diffeomorphisms of a circle mod its PSL2R subgroup. And the phase space is the cotangent bundle of that homogeneous space. So we've made uh, quite a bit of progress at the classical level now in a explicit characterization, well, fairly explicit uh, as, a, as a cotangent bundle of a homogeneous space. Um, we thought actually that this was different from the asymptotically ADS3 case, where it's been shown by Maloney and Witten that the uh, reduced phase space is actually Q cross Q, namely the this homogeneous space cross itself. And I think roughly speaking, that sort of corresponds to um, like right moving and left moving uh, diffeomorphisms at the boundary. And we thought these two were different because they certainly look different, the cotangent bundle of Q and Q cross Q. But apparently it's actually, they're the same. Um, when our Q is identified with the diagonal of Q cross Q. And this was shown, this was pointed out by Ed Witten to Rodrigo when he gave a talk on this topic at a meeting. And uh, the work, it was shown apparently by Scarici and Kras Kirill Krasnov back in uh, 2013. But the, it's, it wouldn't be natural for us to present the phase space as this product because it comes to us geometrically uh, in this other form because the, the space of geometries of our disk is the natural like configuration space, space of conformal geometries. This other form is more natural when you have a time-like boundary at infinity um, in asymptotically ADS. I still find it kind of puzzling though that they're the same because um, in the asymptotically ADS case, we're specifying the boundary asymptotics of the metric, but not, not the length of the boundary metric. So we have this other ingredient in our construction, just specifically the length, but I guess that just doesn't make much difference because it's still, it's still fixing a boundary metric, which is done in either case. So uh, as I said earlier, the, the interpretation of these states is all the, all, all the shapes or ways of embedding this uh, 
diamond into the ADS, but you can also think of it as just the ways of embedding the boundary circle into ADS as the boundary of a space-like disk. And here's a picture of a few ways of doing it. Uh, so this is a picture, of like a coordinate picture. We, if we take the T, R, and theta coordinates for the ADS metric, um, and then just treat them as Cartesian coordinates in, in three dimensions and plot our boundary curve with different values of the, you know, with different types of boundary curves, just to give you at least a little bit of intuition. The, if we just deform the shape of the curve in one time slice, that has no momentum. That's just a configuration deformation. So this has a different conformal uh, two geometry than the round disk has. We could also deform it only in the time-like direction. And that would be like a pure momentum deformation of the curve. And later what will play an important role is there's, if we do both uh, a configuration and a momentum, we can create what, what you can call a spinning string because it actually has spin in a sense that I'll make clear. The Hamiltonian, just real briefly, that's the thing York worked out back in 72. You can um, start with the action and separate out the trace of the extrinsic curvature, which is basically like related to the trace of the, of the conjugate momentum. Um, and on shell, when the constraints are satisfied, the phase space action is just pi h dot because the rest of it would be constraints that vanish. And this whole thing can be pulled down to the reduced phase space. And the formula takes by basically separating out the one um, trace part of this as the time. And then what we get is the, um, the canonical symplectic form on the reduced phase space minus just the integral of the square root of the determinant of the metric. So it's the area of the disk. So the Hamiltonian is, I forgot to put a DT here. The Hamiltonian is, um, is the area of the CMC slice. And that's not constant, right? On the, on the maximal slice, it's the maximal area. As you move up, say, to the future or back to the past, the area gets smaller. So it's a time-dependent Hamiltonian. Moreover, it's it's extremely implicit function of our reduced phase space variables, because how would we figure out what sorry what h is, what the, the determinant of the metric is? We have to get the vial factor. First of all, we'd have to start with a, a, an element of that homogeneous space that's a diffeomorphism modulo PSL two R extend it into the bulk and get a conformal geometry, solve for the conformal factor by solving the Lishnerowitz equation. It's a non-local thing. And then construct the area element from that solution. And that's what the Hamiltonian is. So it's very, very implicit function of, uh, of the reduced phase space variables. Okay, that's the full classical story. And now the rest of this is quantizing. So I want to describe Chris Isham's suggestion for how to generalize you know, the original canonical quantization concept of Dirac. This is something Isham worked out in, um, in the 90s, I guess. No, maybe even the 80s. Um, it hasn't been, as far as I know, very much popularized, but it's actually a very elegant and very natural scheme. And you know, if, the, if, if it makes sense, at all to canonically quantize general systems. It seems like Isham's suggested way to do it is, you know, would be the right way. Of course, what's right and what's wrong when it comes to canonical quantization is really just determined by experiment because we had no right to discover quantum theories by just waving a, a quantization wand over a classical theory in the first place. It's worked a few times brilliantly and uh, this is just a guess of how it might work again. So basically he wants to generalize the idea that X and P, imagine you have a standard like one dimensional 
configuration space and its face space is a, is a plane coordinatized by a Q and a P. Then we canonically quantize Q and P, but what are they you know, doing as group generators on phase space? Q is generating via Poisson brackets momentum translations and momentum is generating position or Q configuration coordinate translations. And the group of translations of Q and P acts transitively on the phase space. You can get from any point to any other by acting. So Aisham wants us to do the same thing on a, on a more complicated phase space. That is find a, a transitive group of symplectomorphisms. And once we have it, what it means to canonically quantize is find the canonical generators of that group classically called charges or Hamiltonians and find their Poisson bracket algebra and then um, find unitary irreducible in general projective representations of that algebra or of that group. So each generator of the group is associated with a Hamiltonian charge. These would be the Qs and Ps in the simplest case. The Poisson algebra, that is the algebra of functions on phase space that generate this group transformations by, you know, canonically as Hamiltonians, um, is isomorphic to the algebra of the group you started with possibly with a central extension, because to realize it canonically, in general, you need a central extension. And transitiveness is important because it implies that any observable, any function on the phase space can be expressed in terms of these charges QI that generate these group transformations. And finally then quantization would be the standard replacement of Poisson brackets with one over I H bar times uh, commutators. And you can see that this whole scheme depends on choosing that group and in general phase space would admit more than one transitive group of symplectomorphisms. And once you've got the group on a choice of the representation of it. Um, so there's a lot of choices involved here, but maybe in some cases there's a particularly natural choice. Excuse me, I, I have a question. Don't you have, uh, say, maximal group G of symplectomorphy? Something a like maximal this. group. Yeah, I don't think so. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Oh, I guess yes, you could. Uh, but then you have way too much. So yeah, that I didn't write that down. You don't want the group to be too big. You kind of want a minimal group. Um because otherwise you have too many independent quantum operators and the quantum theory won't have the, a nice correspondence to the classical theory in a classical limit. There are things you would want to, you know, classically um, commute that won't commute quantum mechanically, so to speak. So I think it's, it's key to make it kind of minimal. There is one restriction we can impose, and this turned out to be interesting in an example I'll mention in a second, that there can be Casimir invariance of the Poisson algebra, which, you know, as a correspondence principle, we can demand that they have the same, the corresponding quantum Casimirs have the same value. And that's a, a way to pin down a little bit the representation of the quantum algebra. And I want to just describe here, before we get back to the diamond, an example. So as we were doing this, in order to get more familiar with the scheme and how it worked and what it meant, Rodrigo and I considered the very much simpler problem of a particle on a two-sphere. This is a single, you know, non-relativistic particle moving on on a two-sphere. So this is something that Eichstrom had actually considered originally. We souped it up with a magnetic monopole, which I'll mention in a second, but just to give you the conceptual idea of how the whole scheme works, this is a very good example. So the two sphere, the face space then is the cotangent bundle of the two sphere. And the two sphere is actually a homogeneous space. It's the quotient of the three dimensional rotation group SO3 by an SO2 subgroup that leaves invariant a point any point, so it's a homogeneous space. Now, a natural group that acts transitively on this phase space can be constructed as follows. 
first of all, obviously SO3 acts on the configuration space and that can be lifted naturally to the cotangent bundle, that configuration action. So we've got a big piece of the group right there is just SO3 action on the phase space. But it's not enough because it doesn't act transitively because it really acted only on the coordinates on the sphere and then by you know, lifting it acted on the cotangent vectors. But we need a way to translate the cotangent vectors on one fiber. See, th this SO3 maps points to points and, and the cotangent vectors at one point to those at another point. But we need a way to just translate cotangent vectors at one point to, to other cotangent vectors at the same point. And to do that, um, we do that and it ends up being uh, the, uh, the three-dimensional Euclidean group is, uh, is the group structure of our, of our group. How do we define the momentum translations? Well, Isham suggested that we think of the sphere as embedded in a three-dimensional space, three-dimensional vector space as an orbit of SO3, which is actually, and then the cotangent vectors in that vector space that SO3 is in, in, in sorry, I'm saying it wrong. The dual vectors in the vector space that SO3 is embedded in are also cotangent vectors when restricted to the orbit. And so we can just shift the cotangent vectors by the dual vectors of the space in which the configuration space is realized as an SO3 orbit. It sounds complicated. I, I made it sound more complicated than it is. Let me say it a different way. Take the two sphere realized as an orbit of, of the rotation group in three-dimensional Euclidean space. Take the, lin the linear coordinates of that three-dimensional Euclidean space and restrict them like X, Y, and Z, restrict them to the surface of the sphere and they define functions on the sphere that generate whose differentials generate, well, whose differentials are cotangent vectors, and they can be used to just shift the cotangent vectors. So those are the momentum translations. And together with SO3, they form a 3D Euclidean group that's the semi direct product of the rotation group with these momentum translations. Now, the, so we have to, to quantize, we want to find irreducible unitary representations of that Euclidean group. And um, they're classified, those representations are classified by the action of the SO2 little group using this um, so-called Mackey theory. You can classify all the representations. And uh, the, the little group corresponds to the spin of the particle. And if you match the Casimir invariant of the classical and quantum algebra, you determine that the spin is zero. If we started with a particle with zero spin um, on the sphere. Now to get some practice, uh, Rodrigo and I considered, you know, generalizing this question to adding a magnetic monopole flux and making the particle charged. So now we have a uniform magnetic field on the sphere. We included the magnetic field globally, you know, there's no global vector potential on the sphere that gives a magnetic monopole field, but you can globally include the monopole instead by um, adding to the symplectic form, the natural symplectic form on phase space, the magnetic field two form. And that's an old a way that was discovered a long time ago that you can incorporate an external electromagnetic field in, in phase space by changing the symplectic form basically by adding the field strength to the symplectic form. And when we do that, the quantizing group is still the same Euclidean group, but there's a different Casimir invariant, which actually reflects the charge and the strength of the magnetic field. And that, when we quantize, that actually leads to the famous Dirac quantization condition on the monopole charge. That is, if we demand that the Casimir of the classical charged particle in this magnetic field on the sphere is matched in the quantum representation, the magnetic field, um, the magnetic monopole strength times the electric charge is quantized. 
we actually classified all the representations purely algebraically, kind of using the way you classify representations of the rotation group. We did it for this Euclidean group and explained how they're related to the ones you get using Mackey theory. And that's in this paper that's also on the archive. It's a different, it's not the diamond paper, it's a separate paper. So I paused on that just to hopefully give you some intuition about how Isham's group quantization scheme works when you start with a phase space that's cotangent bundle of a homogeneous space. And now we want to apply it to the, to the case of our um, causal diamond or our disk. So because again, Q in our case is this homogeneous space, it's the diffeomorphisms of the circle mod PSL2R. Um, the configuration translations are nothing but the action of the diffeomorphism group of the circle. And that action can be lifted to a symplectic action on the cotangent bundle. And then we need again, momentum translations. So we used Isham's recipe. He said, um, given a group that acts on the configuration space, find a representation of that group on a vector space so that at least one orbit, some orbit of the group is isomorphic to the configuration space. This, in, this, in the case of the particle on the sphere, that was finding a representation of the rotation group on three-dimensional Euclidean space, such that it had an orbit that was equivalent to the sphere, the two-sphere. And then let the linear coordinates on that vector space define the momentum translations. Actually, it's by minus the differential of the coordinate. Or putting it differently, we're letting the, the uh, dual vectors in the vector space V define translations of the, of the cotangent vectors. Now it gets a bit subtle. Okay, it's because we're dealing with infinite dimensional groups. And unlike the case of the particle on the sphere, there's no representation. Well, we don't know any representation of diff S1 that has an orbit isomorphic to this quotient of diff S1 mod PSL2R. But in the mathematical physics literature, it was already known that there is an orbit of a centrally extended diffeomorphism group. And in general, when we quantize, central extensions are like part of the story because they just end up corresponding to phase factors multiplying states and quantum states are arrays in Hilbert space, not vectors. So it's natural to allow for uh, central extensions. And the central extension of the diffeomorphism group by one central generator is called the Virasoro group. And there is a representation of the Virasoro group on its dual Lie algebra, which is isomorphic to Q. So that's the orbit that we're gonna use. Here's kind of like a conceptual picture of it. The, um, let's see, the dual Lie algebra of the, the Virasoro group Lie algebra, we're writing as Vera in this Gothic lowercase script. The dual of it is, is indicated with the star there. And that's equivalent to the dual of the algebra of the diffeomorphism group, semi-direct product with, semi-direct sum, sorry, with just the real numbers as an additive group. So we're gonna take the, the group action to be K, the Virasoro group, and the space we're, we're acting on is the vector space that's the, the dual of its Lie algebra. And then we get this orbit that's equivalent to Q. And this gives us a um, transitive group of symplectomorphisms of our phase space. If we add, uh, you know, as I said, the translation by the dual vectors in V. Now, v was already the dual of Vera, so it's the dual of the dual of Vera, semi-direct product with the Virasoro group. And that's our transitive group action. Uh, I just, this is a formula expressing what I just said in words of how it acts, but I think I should keep going. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes. 
Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, what's the action of this additional R factor on uh, on Q? The action of the additional, oh, it's trivial. Uh, okay, uh, thanks. But it's needed in order to get an orbit that's equivalent to uh, Q. Um, okay. So the, now we're going to represent this by Fourier basis. So it'll be a little more explicit, like what algebra we're actually talking about. Um, the algebra of the group is the Verisoro algebra under a, as an additive group, semi-direct sum with the Verisoro. That was again because we started with um, we started with this group that's the semi-direct product of the Verisoro group with the dual of the dual of the Lie algebra of the group. So when we go to the level of algebras, that just becomes the semi-direct sum of the Verisoro algebra as an additive algebra with the Verisoro algebra. Verisoro algebra, it's just the, basically the infinitesimal diffios semi-direct sum with the central generator piece. And infinitesimal diffios are vector fields on the circle. So we can Fourier transform those vector fields and work with an indexed basis indexed by an integer because the circle is a closed you know, group. We can Fourier analyze with respect to an angle coordinate around it. And the Q translations then, um, so it only have an element in the second factor here. And those would be given by just e to the i n, we're using a complex basis, e to the i n theta, where n is an integer, times the vector field d by d theta on the boundary. And the central element is just some fixed central element. And then the momentum translations um, act in the other factor similarly. And if we work out the algebra of this group, it looks like this. So the Ks, the momentum translations commute with themselves and the generators of the Virasoro group have this um, famous Virasoro group algebra with a central extension. This is written slightly differently than um, is sometimes seen. And that's because our definition of L0 is shifted by a constant compared to what's a more standard way of writing it. And then the L's act on the K's in the way that's indicated by the semi-direct product. Okay. And there are two central charges here are, uh, that have to be chosen R and T, but by the Casimir matching, they'll be fixed. So, to figure that out, we need to find functions on phase space. So this is just the group structure, but we need to realize this group as canonical transformations on the phase space. So we have to find functions on the phase space with that acting as Hamiltonians generate these group transformations. And that can be done. And we just rename them the generators L and K to their names as functions on phase space, PN and QN. And the central charges in order to match the um, in order to realize this group on the phase space should be R should be zero and T should be one. Let me go back and say what they were. R was the central extension in the LL commutator and T was the one in the KL commutator. So the Poisson bracket algebra now, we're almost at quantizing, is then given by this in terms of these PNs and QNs. Now, this algebra happens to be the same as a centrally extended BMS3 algebra. BMS3, the Bondi Metzler Sachs group, is um, familiar, not at all in this situation, is familiar as a group that acts on a, a null boundary of space time, of an asymptotically flat space time at null infinity, corresponding to rotations and like scalings and shiftings, rather, of the. Um, on the null generators. Um, but here it's appearing in a completely different setting. Our causal diamond does have a null boundary, 
in its domain of dependence, but we haven't used that anywhere in this construction. This is actually just a, a transitive group that was natural to choose that acts on our phase space. But it is the same as the BMS3 group. So this is the group that we want to uh, quantize, that is find irreducible unitary representations of, and in a way that has the correct, um, well, preserves the classical Casimirs. So when we quantize, we um, you know basically turn those things into operators and divide by IH bar. So um, here's our quantum algebra. And because we use complex functions, you know, the P, these are not Hermitian, but the Hermitian conjugate of Pn is P minus N and similarly for Q. Okay, I'm gonna focus now a lot on one particular generator, P naught. The charge P naught can be interpreted as the spin of the diamond or the spin of this element in the phase space. It corresponds to, so it's a, it, it's, it's a subgroup, it's one of the generators of diff S1, which is the Virasoro, which we're embedding into the Virasoro group. And it's the one that's just uh, generates the SO2 subgroup that acts as isometries of the boundary. You know, in general, if we apply, as I said earlier, a diffeomorphism to the boundary loop, we don't preserve the metric. But there's an SO2 subgroup that does preserve it. And the, th and the element of the algebra that generates that is P naught. So it's, it could be considered as the spin because it's direct analog of the, of the rotation generator that preserves the asymptotic metric, let's say, um, in an asymptotically flat space time or even asymptotically ADS. But it turns out it's also proportional, and I don't have an intuition for why this is true, but it's a calculation that shows it. It's also proportional to the twist of the boundary loop, which I'll define sharply in a second. And the proportionality goes like this. You take the length of the boundary loop divided by 16 pi squared Newton's constant times the twist, and that's what P naught is. So what is the twist of a loop? This is actually a concept from um, loops in Euclidean space, but it can be generalized to Lorentzian space times. So at a point on the loop, you take a, uh, a normal frame that would be a dyad here, mu, or I don't know what these letters are. Rodrigo wrote this slide, mu and n. Anyway, you take a orthonormal frame, you transport it around the loop, at each infinitesimal step, projecting back into the normal plane to the loop. That's called Fermi Walker transport. And you carry that all the way around the loop and come back to where you started. And it will be another orthonormal frame, but it will be in general rotated in Euclidean space relative to the initial one. And the rotation angle is the twist. In our case, it's a hyperbolic angle. So it's a boost and it's uh, yeah, the hyperbolic twist of the, of the boundary loop. And why that function of the geometry is the same as the spin. Yeah, like I said, I don't have an intuition for why that's true. But it does, it's a characterization of the way the loop is shaped. Here's a picture we got from uh, Wikipedia, actually, of a Euclidean example. So the twist is actually the integral of a density along the curve that's called the torsion. And here's just a graphical representation of what happens when you Fermi Walker transport. It's a little hard to see, of course, what the final rotation is because this is moving around, but that hopefully gives you a little bit of an idea. Okay, so now I get to, I'm getting near the end. Actually, how much time is, have I eaten up? Uh, can you tell me, Yurik, how much time is left? Uh, uh, we, we don't, we are not very uh, rigorous about this. So uh, you, can, you can talk for 15 minutes and it will be still considered as a regular time. Okay, I think it'll actually be less than, less than 15 minutes more. 
Okay, so um, here's the thing. This, this P naught we can extract, we can infer from the form of the algebra that this P naught is quantized. And that will mean that the twist of the boundary loop is quantized. So how do we infer it? If we look at just a, a sub a special case of the algebra of commutation relations, we find that the commutator of P naught with any P n is n times P n and with any Q n is n times Q n. And this means that the P n and the Q n act as ladder operators that if, if we act on a state, suppose we start with a state that's an eigenstate of P naught with eigenvalue S, some S. P naught is Hermitian, so any real number S. And we act on that state with P n or Q n. That shifts the eigenvalue. It gives us a new eigenstate of P naught with a new eigenvalue that's S plus N. So since N runs from minus infinity to infinity in the integers, the spectrum of P naught is, is S plus all possible Ns. Since Ns are any integer, we might as well restrict S to the unit interval. And since we're looking for irreducible representations, we should pick one S uh, rather than including representations with many S's in the spectrum. Now there's an interesting restriction on S if we preserve the fact that the classical theory is time reversal invariant, because a time reversal flips the sign of this P naught. I guess that's kind of obvious if you think of it as the spin, time reversal would flip its sign. But you can just show from its definition that its sign flips. And if and so the spectrum of it, if the, if the quantum theory preserves that classical or realizes that classical time reflection symmetry, the spectrum of P naught should be invariant under sign flip. And that's only true if S is zero or one half. Any other value, if you flip, uh, you would get a different yeah, the negative values would not be just the negatives of the positive values. So there are two possible uh, quantizations that preserve the time reflection symmetry. And the twist of the diamond boundary loop is then quantized. Let me get let me bring in the H bar a little bit explicitly here, um, going back to the quantization of P naught. So P naught is quantized, but P naught has dimensions of action, like a you know, rotation generator. So this quantity here has dimensions of action. So it's gonna be proportional to S plus N times H bar. And if we solve for T, the H bar will be multiplied by G and divided by L. So we'll get the ratio of the Planck length to uh, the, the boundary loop circumference. So here's the formula for twist quantization. Um, if the boundary loop is you know, very big compared to the Planck length, the units of twist quantization are very tiny. And so we get the classical limit that there's no quantization and the limit of zero Planck length or very, or very large uh, boundary loop. We found it remarkable that you could, so we haven't actually found explicitly a representation of this algebra. We just use the algebra structure and this time reflection symmetry a little bit to, to infer this property of the boundary loop. So let me just summarize what I've said and on this slide. And then I just have a, a slide, a two slides where I mentioned some open questions and that's the end. So we considered two plus one dimensional uh, pure gravity with a negative or possibly zero cosmological constant in the domain of dependence of a topological disk with a fixed boundary metric. That's the system. Use constant mean curvature gauge for the time and solve the constraints using the Lushnerowitz method. Eliminated all gauge ambiguities and wound up with a reduced phase space. That's the cotangent bundle of orientation preserving diffeomorphisms of a circle mod PSL2R subgroup. The Hamiltonian is the area of the constant mean curvature slice. <clears throat> and it's a very complicated function on the reduced phase space. And in particular, 
we should express it as a function of our P and Q, P N and Q N, you know, quantum operators, but we have no idea how to do that. And of course, it seems like any way you try to do that, you're going to wind up with operator ordering ambiguities. Maybe lurking somehow in this formalism, there is some extremely natural way to express the area, the quantum area of this disk in terms of these operators, but we don't know what it is. Um, we quantized using Isham's group theoretic method with this uh, semi direct with a transitive canonical group that's the semi direct product of Virasoro group with its the dual of the dual of its Lie algebra. And that's actually the BMS3 group or a central extension of it. Mackey's theory of induced representations would give representations, which I didn't mention yet, by wave functions on co-adjoint orbits of this Virasoro group with labels in unitary irreducible representations of the little group. And the simplest case and a suitable orbit that matches the Casimirs of the, um, it basically matches the central extensions of the classical Poisson bracket algebra, a suitable orbit is just exactly the configuration space itself. So it's just like quantizing the particle on the sphere in that case. You would take wave functions on the sphere and um, the little group there was SO2. And you could choose non-trivial representations of that SO2 to get a irreducible representation and they would correspond to particles with spin could realize by quantization that spin is a possible quantum degree of freedom. Similarly here, we have to choose irreducible representations of PSL2R, but unlike in the sphere case, we don't know which representation of PSL2R to take. I mean, there's no Casimir matching that chooses one for us. You could say the simplest one is the trivial one, uh, but maybe, that's not the only interesting one from the viewpoint of quantum gravity. And the spin is um, related to the hyperbolic twist of the, of the boundary loop and it's quantized, as I said. And here's some open questions. I just, as I just said, how do we select the correct representation? Um, what's the quantum dynamics of the diamond? As I mentioned, can the Hamiltonian actually be quantized exactly, meaning expressed in terms of our quantum operators? or at least approximately, is there some kind of a perturbation theory that could be used? Here's a big open question. What are the QN as geometrical, what geometrical actions do they generate on the disc or on the diamond? We know what the PNs are. They, you know, P0 was the SO2, just like the rotation generator of the boundary loop. And um, it's the, twist, which is the integral of the torsion, and the other PNs are different like Fourier components of the torsion of the boundary loop. So that's a rather explicit geometrical meaning of them. But the QNs, we don't know what they are. We know that two things about them, they involve the um, Schwarzian derivative of the boundary diffeomorphism, which is a complicated thing involving third derivative. And we know they only depend on the conformal class of the spatial metric. So they depend on the, the configuration space variable only. Um, let's see, yeah, what about Q naught? So focusing on Q naught, it's an interesting one. In the asymptotically flat case, remember the group of symmetries at null infinity is the same B group, BMS3, and the element of the generator Q naught or rather minus it in that case plays the role of the energy or rather the generator of retarded time translations that moves you up along the null generators of future null infinity up to a scaling factor. So that's like a Hamiltonian. So by analogy, this suggests that for the diamond, it should be some sort of quasi-local mass or energy of the diamond. Um, but we haven't been able to figure out a geometrical characterization of what this is. It turns out we, um, 
Opelak showed, I should have written that here, who showed it, that for the, or maybe he got that from somewhere else, but for the representation on the orbit that's just equal to our homogeneous space here, the spectrum of Q naught or minus Q naught is bounded below by minus two pi. That eigenvalue is realized actually on a non-normalizable state that's supported on a flat round disk. So the point of this conceptually is that it really does sort of act as an energy that's bounded below, which is what you might hope and expect, um, but we don't know its geometrical meaning. Now, it's also interesting that it commutes with P naught. So they can be simultaneously specified, the spin or twist of the diamond and whatever this maybe energy-like quantity is. So we should be able to consider the space of simultaneous eigenstates of the two. And a you know, question that's natural to ask is what is that space and is it finite dimensional? You know, when we started this project, I should have maybe said this, but it's a good time to say it. I figured, okay, if we're spending, if we're talking about the space of states of a of a gravity system with a fixed boundary circumference, then according to the Bekenstein Hawking, you know, entropy that we're familiar with, I would expect to find a, a Hilbert space whose dimension is determined by the length of the boundary loop. But the space without fixing, with just fixing P naught is infinite dimensional. Maybe if we fix the eigenvalue of Q naught, which would be analogous to fixing the energy, we'd end up with a finite dimensional space. So that would be very interesting to know, but we don't know it. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning, we don't know what it means to, what the space time of a quantum diamond it means. Does the quantized theory we got depend on the time gauge we chose and on the canonical group we chose, that BMS3 group? And as a final question, what would happen if we uh, include conical singularities or non-trivial topology instead of just having a smooth disk as our um, configuration space? And uh, I actually posed this question to Rodrigo and he sent me an email saying he thinks he knows the answer actually, uh, which I'll just report. If you have a conical singularity, he thinks it just uh, chooses a different um, orbit, a different co-adjoint orbit of the Virasoro group is the appropriate uh, space on which the wave functions of the quantum theory would live. And I guess we'll have to wait for him to explain that in a paper or in a talk or something. But apparently there's recent work on representation theory of the Virasoro group that um, led him to infer that. And if there's non-trivial topology, well, remember if we had no boundary at all, that was the case that uh, Moncrief uh, studied a long time ago, Fisher and Moncrief. And um, it's characterized by a finite dimensional Base space of moduli of these uh, Riemann surfaces. So probably you just like add to the phase space the dimensions corresponding to moduli associated with handles um, of non-trivial topology. The one uh, hesitation I have about thinking that is that it's not so clear to me that the constant mean curvature gauge exists in the diamond if you have non-trivial topology on the spatial slices. And I should end there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So thank you for a fantastic talk and thank you for even asking questions yourself. Uh, <laughs> are there more questions? Uh, what about the Zoom? audience anybody from I, I have a question uh, but, but you are in on site so let us start with the zoom uh, people who attend the talk mm, okay apparently there are no questions so uh, there is a question from the audience here in the, the lecture <clears throat> I, I I don't know much about quantum theories, but here uh, you uh, 
in principle, you solve uh, initial constraints, but only in principle, yeah? there are implicit solutions. So what is the trace of this, uh, say, implicitness in the further quantization? Still, you, you, you quantize it without explicit knowledge of solutions, yeah, so. Right, you mean geometrically. Yeah, I, to, to me that comes up when it, in the Hamiltonian, so we do have an explicit, in a sense, coordinatization of the phase space in terms of these uh, diffios of the circle and actually a conjugate variable that's a function. I didn't go into this in a uh, function on the circle. So we do have a good coordinate system on the phase space, but the problem is if we wanna construct the geometry of the disk, we need to solve the Lishnerowitz equation, which means we need to express, you know, somehow the conformal geometry in the disk in terms of these coordinates and then solve the Lishnerowitz equation. Then we would have the area of the disk and then we would have the Hamiltonian and that's completely implicit. So it's a part of the process of doing, uh, studying the physics that hasn't been carried out and it looks very challenging. So you could say it's a kinematic quantization, but it was at least enough that we could infer that the, the twist of the boundary loop was quantized. So I would have been a bit depressed if we didn't get at least one physical statement out of the analysis. Okay, there is... Uh... There is another question, Maciek Kolanowski. Yeah, I actually have two questions. So first of all, um, is this another form or your face, uh, face space as a product of, uh, as a product of two uh, spaces? Uh, does it give you any other natural choice of quantization or is that just an algebraic thing? I think it would give you a different canonical, a different group to start with, with Aisham's method, right? Because I think you could have something like a, a Virasoro times a Virasoro instead of a BMS3. Okay. And that would still act transitively on the face. And I guess... Can't you actually get BMS free from Virasoro times Virasoro in some limit? I think you can. Um, I think it's a group contraction, but I'm not sure. But why do you ask that? Uh, just in general. Uh, okay, but, but I also wanted to ask uh, if to include conical singularities, you need to choose a different orbit, then I guess that a group of symplectomorphism would be actually different, right? Oh. On I don't think so. No, because I think the idea here is that um, you would not have to change that. The phase space, it sounds like what Rodrigo was saying, and I'm only kind of like transferring partial statement from him in, in an email, but I, my, my interpretation of what he said would be that um, there's a different Casimir matching, that the only way that presence of the conical singularity affects the algebra is through the value of a Casimir invariant or a central charge. And, and therefore you would, um, in order to realize that central charge, the same one in the quantum theory, you would have to choose a different orbit of the co-joint representation of the group, but not that you would change the group. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I'm not okay, sure that's you. right. Uh -huh. I am <clears throat> I am puzzled by this BMS group. So so there is some 
there is this null null boundary of of your of of this region which is causally related determined by by this data on this disk so maybe one could look for for some <laughs> group yeah. acting as soon as rodrigo came up with the um the bms3 group i said this exact same thing and i would think you know you could quantize on the null boundary right? I think I mean, we could, can... instead of taking cauchy surfaces that are space-like maybe you could start the canonical analysis on the boundary of the domain of dependence it's a little tricky because of course for a generic loop that boundary gets kind of nasty. It's nice near the edge of the loop, but in, it'll, you'll have caustics. And so I'm not sure, they wouldn't have probably a globally well-defined action on there, but maybe it's enough to just act near the edge. Mm. So it's a very natural question and I don't know the answer. Yeah, it's, 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 okay. it's intriguing. <laughs> but there are many, many, many intriguing questions. Okay. but. Uh, uh, but then wouldn't you actually uh, wouldn't you actually get them uh, i'm sorry we have too many mics here uh, okay wouldn't you get then uh, actually uh, bms3 times bms3 uh, or would you have to choose some diagonal part or something like this if you wanted to act on on the boundary you mean because there's a future and a past component to the null boundary? Yeah. I, also think that I think one should be enough. That is, you could just restrict to either the future or the past for your quantization, because either one would be a Cauchy surface. But this is pure speculation. Mm -hmm. It seems there are no, no more questions. So thank you, thank you very much for <coughs> giving this fantastic talk. So it was really, really very interesting. Oh, sure. Uh, Yurik, do you want to um, chat for?